Hey guys, how's it going? Today is going to be full of absolutely random projects that are going to take us all around the garden uh, and hopefully into the kitchen by the end of the day. So I've got some planting projects I got done over the weekend that I'd like to show you, kind of so you can see the before shot of what they look like. And then we've got some things that I started from seed that desperately need to be put out in the garden somewhere. Then we are going to start pulling all of the spring flowering bulbs from the cut flower garden. And after that, I'm hoping that the kids and I have some time to pick some strawberries and make some popsicles. So first off, let's take a look at those planting projects I did this weekend. I just tossed a camera up. I didn't explain anything about what the plants were or any of that. So the first project you will see took place at my parents' house. I took a few flats of things, Super Tuny Royal Velvet, Super Bina Sparkling Amethyst, which match the pots that are on my parents' deck. And we planted them just off the deck in one of their flower beds, it's so pretty. My mom placed them, I popped them in the ground, and then we went swimming. <laughs> so that's the first project. It was not very uh, complicated. I just wanted to show you before because it's gonna look pretty spectacular here in a, a month or so. And then the second project took place here, and it involves uh, an Angelonia, a, a euphorbia, supertunia, and superbina. So let me show you all of these plants going in the ground and then we'll walk through the project here. Okay, now that you've seen the plants go in, let's do a walk through here. We've got this spot along our lane where I have planted things that are gonna get quite large. Like I've got a blue spruce right here. I can't remember the full size, but I think this spreads like 15 to 20 feet. There is a haywire, I think that's what it's called. Is that a juniper cypress? I don't remember, but it gets like 18 feet wide. And then we've got a London plane tree, which get enormous. And I've also got a spruce tree right here, which will get really big. So I could come in with some shrubs and things like that, which I might eventually, but it's one of those spots that I don't wanna pack out too full with stuff, with permanent stuff, because the other things in here are going to need the space. So it's kind of a prime spot to pop in some beautiful annuals. So that's what we did. And I don't think I've ever done a big drift of annuals right here anyway, so I'm excited about it. We've got the Angelonia popped throughout the back, uh, kind of on this side of the blue spruce and then just beyond it. And those will get 30 to 40 inches tall. Uh, and I did space them further than the tag said. I kind of thought it might be pretty to have them a little bit separate so it's not such a block, if that makes sense. It'll still be a block of color. I left the hose strung out so I could water them today. Uh, and then the next layer are the diamond frost euphorbia, which I just did in little groups. So there's a group here, there's a little group here, and then there's a group right here. And those will get just a few inches taller than the supertunia, which is the saffron finch. And oh, such a gorgeous 
Supertunia. It's one of my favorites right now. It just shines. And you know, we put these Supertunias in my parents' containers along their driveway, which I had initially ordered for our containers along the east fence line. And then when we decided to do the container competition, I had this huge surplus of Supertunias. So that's what kind of um, prompted the whole project out at their house, which turned out beautiful. And then the next layer down, which tends to grow a little bit flatter than the Supertunias, is the Superbina Cobalt. I think that these two colors, aren't they opposites on the color wheel or close to opposites? They are so pretty together, the blue and the yellow. Then you've got that sparkly white with the euphorbia. Then we'll have that kind of blue, lavender blue toward the back. It's just gonna be so pretty, it already is. Anyway, I think that this is just gonna be beautiful and I wanted to make sure you saw the before, what it looked like right after they went in versus what they're gonna look like here very soon, which I anticipate it being pretty spectacular right here. I think it's gonna be amazing. And you can see I'm trying to like hunker in this little bit of shade that's on the driveway. I think we're only supposed to be in the high 80s today, but then it's gonna go into the mid to high 90s and then we get to have a big cool down, which means we'll probably get a lot of wind, but it looks like about five or so days in the 70s, which I'm looking forward to. But right now it's fairly early-ish in the morning. 7 45 8 ish and uh it feels cool out still i love it so here's what we've got the white swan marigolds which are not white they come up this beautiful pale yellow and i've got these leftover crespedia that did not fit in the cut flower garden which bloom a more vibrant yellow i thought about putting them somewhere together in the landscape and then we've got a bush cucumber this is our only cucumber plant that i'm putting in the ground these usually produce a tremendous amount of cucumbers and then I've got a couple of trays of white delphiniums, which are trying to bloom. Um, so I wonder what they look like when I pop them out. Let's see, I'll find one that's easy to pop out. Oh, not too bad. I was actually surprised here too. I pulled one of the marigolds out. And I mean, definitely need to get out of these little cells, but not horrible. So we're just gonna run around and get that done quick. Right, delphiniums are in. I did one of the trays right here, which ended up being 21 plants, and they're tucked in behind the Midnight Masquerade Penstemon, and there's some pink Veronica, some Baptisia, that's decadence chocolate, dark chocolate. There's some Russian sage, and these will grow about four feet tall, so they should just be this beautiful patch right in here. And the others went in right there, also ended up being 21 plants. I think it'll be nice along this walkway to have some repeats of the same thing. So having two big patches of the white delphinium will be really nice. And we've got the El Nino Chitalpa right here next door to them, uh, which they're starting to bud up. Super impressed by this plant, let me tell you. When you have a plant that you thought died over the course of the winter, and it springs back from like the base of the plant and gets this big this quickly with buds on it, that's pretty awesome. So I actually have a couple more out in the high tunnel that I'd like to tuck in out here because the blooms are fragrant. They look like kind of like orchid slash snapdragon blooms. It looks like something that should not survive here. And um, that's why I'm so impressed by it. But anyway, these are the Guardian White variety of Delphinium. I'm not sure I mentioned that, which the Guardian series, they were bred to um, actually be good for greenhouse production uh, and short days. They also perform really well in long days as well. So if you live in a climate, I think they're zone three through seven. If you're like in a zone three or so, or have shorter days, this might be a good variety to try out. But but, you know three to four feet tall big white panicles with little green um, dots on the white blooms I just think they're so pretty the pollinators love them too okay so I think next we are gonna tackle the cucumber and you guys <laughs> to tell you what happened here so I reached in to grab my biotome brand new fresh bag picked it up the handle snapped the whole bag fell on my cucumber plant so this one's fine but this one got crushed on well kind of crushed see how it's sort of bent there and there's a little pile of biotone in, in the tray and in here. 
So I don't know, we might get half as much production, which is still more than we can probably keep up with. But I was like, oh, dang it when that happens. But let's go plant that one. I'm just gonna grab some of this biotone, pop it right there. And we are gonna plant it right at the end of the row where we just planted our green beans, which are all up and looking great. Look at that and all the sunflowers. Oh, but I figured we could maybe sort of drape the stems on our tomato frame and keep it tidy, maybe. There we go. Hopefully it likes it there. Done. Tomatoes are looking awesome. Remember when we got those in the ground? They are robust. Noticing a few little fruits forming up. Okay, now for these. I am gonna pop a few of the marigolds in an empty spot I have in the cut garden. It's a spot I thought I had filled already, but I was walking by it last night and I, I haven't filled it yet. So we can utilize a few of these. They won't need biotone, that's for sure. Won't need to amend the soil. They have been amended. Look at all of our corn. Okay, see it's just this tiny little spot right here. Honestly, could just let this celosia go. Maybe we'll just let them grow together. turned into a little bit more than just marigold and crispedia planting. I got those planted over here and as I was planting I initially made some holes up toward the front of the sidewalk but these you can see get so tall and they're a little uh, loosey-goosey at the moment. I need them to root in quick before we get some wind but I thought you know what we need a second layer here or a front layer rather. So I made sure to bump them all back a bit and I brought some Super Tunia Mini Vista Indigo in and repeated it on the other side. It's so pretty, especially again, we have that pale yellow and blue blend. It's just the most beautiful thing. And I was thinking, oh, it would be so pretty to cut in with maybe a purple butterfly bush, something like that right in this area. I'm not sure, we'll see what happens. But uh, for now, we've got the Crispedia. We only had what, seven of those. So I tuck those in together and then the marigolds start behind the Crespedia and do their little thing, their little drift there. And then, you know, the mini Vista Indigo and then they start here and they go, they keep going. I couldn't continue because there's iris and sedum and stuff, but these go all the way to the Veronica. I had exactly enough to get me all the way to the first perennial. I love that. It gives it such a sort of finished look. Oh, there's a swallowtail over there. And now I feel like I don't need to come in here right away with perennials. There's so many other spaces that I can focus on with perennials and things like that, you know, near walkways and I mean the whole rest of it. There's not very many things. There's a lot of open spaces. So now I don't have to worry about this one. It's going to look so pretty and full of color all season. All right, now that that's done, we started with the real project, which is 
our tulips. Let's head to the cut flower garden. I've got my crates here or a couple of them. We're gonna need a whole bunch more than that, but I don't anticipate this project taking too long. Okay, here we are. So the first four rows out here, you know, are planted up with bulbs. The first one with daffodils. This one is mostly tulips, tulips, and tulips. Um, you can see that some varieties have completely dried down, like the acabano over there, uh, some of the best tulips, and this is kind of what you want them to look like when you get ready to pull them. Not necessarily like this. These are still fairly green, but they are starting to show, you know, some of them are yellow, some leaves are yellow. They don't look great, but usually with bulbs, and this goes with bulbs that you're keeping in the ground too, you want to wait till they're yellow and die back completely. Actually, the foliage comes off really easy at that point. You can just go along and just kind of gather it up instead of having to cut it off at the base. Um, and that way, the bulb, you know, has recharged completely. It's really important to leave the leaves up until they do that because, you know, they're soaking in sun that whole time and that sun is being converted to energy and being stored in that bulb so that they have the energy to bloom the next season. But here we are, middle of June, and these look really bad, and I wanna get some um, zinnias and cosmos going. I don't have any of those seeded yet. I was saving these rows, and so I thought, you know what, I'm gonna give them till mid-June. We're gonna pull them, and we'll just see what happens. I think they probably have enough energy to do it again next year, uh, but we'll pull them today and let them finish dying back before we get them uh, cleaned off and put in storage so they can still continue to draw energy from the leaves uh, into their bulb. It's kind of like onions and garlic in that way. And I've never lifted tulips and daffodils because we can leave them in the ground. All the rest of them in our flower beds I leave in the ground and they come back year to year. Daffodils better than tulips. But with these right here, there's so many of them. And you know, we could take the time to pop them out and go plant them somewhere in the garden. But I would really like to do this again next year and I'd really not like to not have to order a whole bunch more. So I did some reading on storing and you know, you can uh, pull them, uh, clean them off after they've dried back, the foliage has dried back. And then you don't have to store them in like a root cellar situation where they stay really cool. It just needs to be like, a normal temperature, not too warm, not too cold, uh, somewhere where they don't dry out completely. So some people will store them in peat moss or I'm gonna try, try vermiculite like we do our dahlia tubers because I have that on hand. Um, and then you just hold on to them until you're ready to plant them again, just like this in the fall. And I think, you know, our method of planting these was just lining them up on the ground and then we mounted compost up and they did beautifully. So I don't anticipate these being, well, maybe they will be harder to pull than I think. Ugh. Oh, that one was actually several bulbs. Interesting, let's try another one. Okay, I'm gonna have to use a tool probably to assist me because they have rooted in, but oh, look at that. This is what I'm hoping for. I want the leaf to stay on. This one has turned into, oh my goodness. Okay, so I planted one bulb and we have now one, two, three, four, five, six. One, hold on. One, two, three, four, five, yeah, six bulbs. Oh my gosh. So we'll be taking our crate and this is what we store dahlia tubers in, something that's breathable like this. And I'm just going to line all of our bulbs up, something like that, I guess. Each variety will have their own crate so we can keep them separate. And then we'll either store them on the floor in the barn in the shade or in the studio, one of the two. So this really won't take a whole lot of time. I don't think it's just getting it done. We're gonna take a quick break before we pull the bulbs because Paul brought in some baby frogs that they found out on their property so that the kids could release them in the pond. They're gonna be so excited. They're on their way out. Over here, Benjamin, you excited? He's got them over here in the barn. They're still, in sort of tadpole form. They still have their tails, but they've developed legs. Oh. Isn't that cool? Turn into a frog. Yeah. He got some tiny frogs. They developed legs. Look in there, babe. So they still have their tails, but they've got little legs. Can I have them? You want to hold one? Yeah. Okay. Hold one. Isn't that fun? Oh, there goes a frog already. What if, what do you guys think about us putting them in maybe like right in here or maybe right over there where you can get close to the water? Do you want me to pour one into your hand? Yeah. Okay, pour your, put your hand over the water. <laughs> one jumped in, see it? Yeah. 
that what you, tickles? Does it tickle? Do you want to put it in the water, baby? Don't toss it in. Oh, it went It went on its own. There we go. There it is. Can you get her? It's right here. Not the kid. There it goes. Going to put its friend in. There we go. Okay. You guys, there's three more. <laughs> okay, make sure it doesn't hop out onto the rocks, baby. Maybe put it down in the water. Okay, that's the last one. Oh, that one's just floating. You see it? Yeah, I see another one in the algae there. You got him in? Oh, look at that one swimming. Oh, look at that one. It's floating up to the top. Now it's swimming back down. So they keep going down into the algae and then they swim back to the surface and then they go back down, kind of like the other frogs that we have in here, the bigger ones. So we'll have to keep our eye out for these frogs. Isn't that weird that they start off as a tadpole with a tail and then they push out legs and then the tail goes away? What a fun thing. I hope we are able to see them as they continue to grow. I'm standing. I need help. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you got yourself in a pickle? Okay, I see two, four, six, eight, nine. See the shark and nine koi. Oh, there's ten koi. Where's the eleventh? Oh, right there. Whew, all accounted for. Look at things are looking so much better in here. Every day it's just a little bit better. And this, oh, the most glorious iris ever. What a super fun distraction today. And Paul was actually thinking that we could put some of them in a fountain, like in the fountain up front. And maybe we'll ask if he can bring a few more. And that way they're a bit more contained, easier to spot, so the kids can watch them develop further. Okay, now I'm gonna head back out and get some work done. One row in, I've already got 10 crates filled. So I might just tackle a couple rows today and maybe a couple tomorrow, I don't know. It's starting to feel an awful lot like digging dahlia tubers. But doesn't that look nice? I don't know why I attacked the second row in instead of starting with the first row. Oh well, I think we'll go after this one next. The daffodils were easier to lift. And if you look in here, you can see how nice and big these daffodil bulbs are. And then our tulip bulbs, Boy, they just multiplied like crazy. Most of them I was picking out of there. Like this one, I planted one bulb and now we've got three nice size bulbs. Look at this clump right here. My word. I don't know why, but I was not expecting that. So we actually increased our crop this year, which is awesome. And a lot of our tulips that we plant in the ground, they don't survive uh, over the winter. Not as good, they don't come back as good the second year and the third year as they do that first year. There are some varieties that stay a little bit better than others, but largely we plant, you know, 100 tulips somewhere and the next year we might get 75 and then 50. They just kind of dwindle. So anyway, seeing the bowls multiplied like this uh, is really quite encouraging. So I've got to go unload these crates in the studio and load back up with some empty crates and then we'll come back out here and start in after the road daffodils.
are a row and a half in and I'm gonna call uncle on this project for today, which is a rare thing for me. I usually will muscle through whatever project I'm working on, but I feel like it's kind of unnecessary in this case because honestly, we don't have that many crates left available. Um, so I was only gonna maybe do two full rows today anyway after I assessed how much space we have to let them dry down in the studio and how many crates we have. But the main thing is I should have, it's kind of like Dahlia tubers, I should have turned the water off to these maybe three, four days ago to make it easier for, to dig them because it adds so much more weight and all of that moisture kind of suctions the bulbs down and they are incredibly rooted in. So as I was getting into this daffodil row, I thought this is so unnecessary. I've got one whole row open that I can seed right now or tomorrow probably. I'll turn the water off to the rest of the rows and then I will do that once they've dried down a little bit and make it much easier and quicker. But each run of drip tape, we can operate individually, which is quite nice. I think we only have two per row here, but if I dig around, you can see where one of the rows of drip tape starts. Each one of them has an individual valve that we can shut off. That way, all the rest of our stuff will be watered in this quadrant when this zone runs, but not these rows, like that. Oh, just getting down in there, so wet. Okay, those two rows are off. Let me turn this one off. Oh, perfect. That'll do. And now we'll have plenty of time to get some strawberries. I'm gonna go pick some of those next and I'm just gonna pick a few. I can't remember how many the recipe called for, but I wanted to make sure to have time to make the strawberry popsicles with the kids. Yeah, this recipe calls for one and three quarters cups of strawberries. That's not that many. And then maple syrup, almond milk, lemon juice, and vanilla extract. They sound really good. It's a recipe from the Loopy Whisk. Anyway, let's go get our strawberries and we can get the rest of it together. That ought to do it. I need to get back out here and pick. Just looking at this row, you don't see anything, but you start spreading the leaves apart and oh my word, there are so many. This right here is all honey eye, which is a June bearing type strawberry. But we've got five different varieties. Actually, no, we only have four different varieties going now. My favorite is the honey eye, which is the June bearing and seascape, which is an ever bearing. They're both delicious berries. Uh, anyway, they have just been providing like crazy. I've already made three batches of jam and I've got two all the way filled, I couldn't fill them anymore, Ziploc bags full in the freezer. And I think I have enough at least to do another Ziploc bag and another batch of jam out here. Okay, we've got all of our stuff, I think. Samantha's got the popsicle mold, which they have these little bottoms that collect the juice that's melting so they can drink it out of that little spout, which I think is really cool. Do you love that? Do that. Yeah. Can you show us how it goes in the mold? Great job. Just like that. So it's three quarters cup plus two tablespoons of almond milk, and then two tablespoons of lemon juice, a quarter cup of maple syrup, one teaspoon of vanilla, and one and three quarter cup of our strawberries out of the garden. Sounds good, doesn't it, babe? Yeah. And Benjamin's on his way. You know, I wonder if I should get a funnel. Should I go grab a funnel so that they go into that really easily? We don't make a mess? Yeah, I'm gonna go grab a funnel. So we need to add our strawberries into the blender. Benjamin, wanna do that? We need to add a quarter cup, hold that, of maple syrup. Can you hold that over the blender? Can you put it in that? Can yep, you can put it in that. It calls for maple syrup, and I, I looked for a recipe without sugar, but we might resort to a recipe with sugar and no milk, I don't know. This is a, a complete experiment. That looks great. I would just leave it just like that. Um, can you hold this over the blender? Milk. Okay, put it in. Put it in there. And then put that on the tray once you've got it all out. Two more tablespoons of milk. Okay. And then we need a teaspoon of vanilla. Benjamin, hold that over. And okay. Smell that. Yum. Mm. Okay, now two tablespoons of lemon juice. The lemon we got was huge. So it's hard to squeeze? That's one tablespoon. Well, it's, yeah, I had to cut it into smaller chunks so it would even fit in my juicer thing. Okay, so there's that. But I brought two chunks out. So I think that'll work perfectly. 
I think that's it. So we can put it on the blender, guys, and we can blend it on up. Let's move this Lift out of the way. Up. Lift up, big time. Samantha, push that button right there. Lift up. <laughs> Smells good. You guys want to try a bite? Is that good? Now we put them on this. Interesting with the maple syrup. Ooh. Oh boy, we're gonna have a lot. I said this was a small batch mix, but ooh. All right, well time will tell how these taste. It's four to five hours in the freezer before they're ready to eat. So we'll probably do a little PS at the very end of this video when we open them up to let you know what the kids think. And then the next recipe try we try will be a lot simpler. It's just strawberries, sugar, and lemon juice. I think there's just the three ingredients. I'm guessing the kids are going to like that better one because it's regular sugar and two because there's it's in that milky base. Um, but I thought that this sounded like a really interesting mix of ingredients and it does taste good to me. <laughs> like chill this up. I just um, poured a little bit in a jar. Chill it up and put a little bit of like sweetened cream in it. You have like a strawberry bisque. Mm. Yeah. It'd be good sweetened with honey as well. Anyway, total menagerie of projects, like I mentioned <laughs> at the beginning of our day today. We just were all over the place, got a lot done. I'm really happy about it. Uh, the bulbs, I think will be much easier here in a few days, but I think tomorrow we'll get out and seed that one row of zinnias. We'll get something going in there and that'll be exciting. So anyway, I hope you enjoyed today's video. Thank you so much for watching and we will see you in the next one. Bye. What do you think now that you've been eating it for a while? Do you like it? Ooh, that's pretty good, huh? Mm -hmm. Maple syrup's a little weird. I'm not gonna lie. Hey! But it's pretty good. Hey! <laughs> 96 degrees today, so especially refreshing. Good cheers.